It's good that we're recording this. I think we can we can just kick start and make the best of uh, Greg's time. So, uh, you know, let me introduce today uh, Greg Stewart. He's a good friend uh, and also a, a better, fantastic graphic designer that works at Slack. Uh, he's going to be telling us about the power of communicating science visually through through graphic illustrations. Uh, just as a quick bio for Greg, um, yeah, he's worked uh, as, a, as a leading graphic designer at Slack, uh, which is part of Stanford University since 2006, so he's, he's been around for a long time. Uh, he started off with a huge curiosity for science, and uh, that together with his background in arts uh, has kind of led him to a professional career uh, where he uh, carries a really wide breadth of responsibilities at the lab from you know branding, uh, an identity design to scientific figures and illustrations. Um, many of us in the group have worked with and continue to work with Greg for our own uh, publications. So in today's journal club session, Greg uh, is going to try to provide us with some insights uh, and his experience uh, with tools to design uh, what, are, you know, what the process of scientific il illustrations looks like for beginners, as well as some tips for how to interact with uh, graphic illustration professionals uh, when we cannot make our own figures and we need their help. So with that, uh, Greg, thanks for joining and please take it away. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, yeah, no, I'm really uh, happy to be here to be able to talk with you all about um, this uh, unique sort of intersection of like art and science that I do um, and how even if you're not at that intersection, if you're on one end of the spectrum or the other, how um, just, I don't know, how we all can sort of take something away from the process of creating um, and uh, yeah, so uh, let me go ahead and share some slides. Um, Sergio gave an inter in, uh, introduction, um, but I, I'd also sort of like to begin with a, um, a brief introduction as well um, that captures a little bit more of my background um, and might inform some of sort of what I'm talking about. And, and when people say, you know, a brief introduction, it's it's not always great when they start with, you know, when I was a child, that's not a, a great phrase that you want to hear, um, when especially relates to brief. But um, when I was a kid, I loved doing art and I wanted to be an artist growing up. Uh, when, when I grew up and do, I loved cartoons and Disney animation and all that kind of thing. Um, and fast forward to me getting into college. I went to college in um, California at a small computer arts visual um, college. And uh, there I studied and um, majored in computer graphics, modeling animation. And so um, right out of that, um, as happens, you need a job. And so I just got a job doing video production design at a Silicon Valley company, um, was there for a couple of years, but then got laid off um, and then just needed another job, right? And so um, that kind of led me to, well, the job which is where I work currently, which is the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. As Sergio said, it's a, a, a physics lab um, up at Stanford University. And um, since 2006, I've been doing a myriad of things at the lab um, from, uh, as he mentioned, branding identity design to animations and video, as well as poster design, uh, scientific illustrations and scientific figures. And so, uh, at the lab, I run the gamut of doing all those things. Um, and, uh, you know, you might say, okay, well, Greg, I, I get that you started, you know, as a kid wanting to be an artist, and now you're working at the scientific institution and, and you know, you but where's there's that science background, like what, what enabled you to sort of be able to be successful in your role at Slack as a well, scientific graphic designer. And it kind of comes down to sort of my sort of the things that excite me about science and one of them is star trek and science fiction and the other is sort of education around science um in the form of entertainment and you know mythbusters or discovery channel shows and those kind of things that really get me excited about science that sort of take me to another place or get me thinking about science in, an, in another way and so um because of those things um I feel in, in my background, I feel like I sort of have a, a, a unique perspective on how to illustrate and talk about science visually. Um, and with that, I've been able to sort of take those school skills to what I do at, at work and create some really sort of eye-catching, interesting visuals that help inform the science, whether they be on journal covers 
or um, you know, uh, as part of press packages for um, a number of you know different news outlets. And what's and, and there's a couple things that that are really great about this. One is that you know I get to see my work really displayed in a really cool, awesome way, but also that I'm helping elevate the science of you know of, and the research to a whole different level and and be able to do that visually. And um, the other thing about this is, is that all of all of these illustrations here and all the illustrations I do are not just made up, right? They're all based on, well, these scientific papers. Each one of these illustrations had the research to back it up, the thing to inform what I was helping to visualize. And, um, and that interplay between working with scientists and researchers to help visualize their science is something that I'm really passionate about most in my work. Um, and the other component is, is that those, those papers also had technical figures. They had scientific illustration, you know, figures inside the work. And so you're sort of, if, if you can see where I'm going with this, is that, you know, the visual component to science and research and how we communicate it is really important. Um, um, but I'm going to, and, and this is kind of what we're going to talk about today, but I'll segue into a, a, a little weird thing to sort of talk about food and how, you know, all right, so say, say, say you, you open up Yelp on your phone or something, you're looking for a sandwich or a burrito or something, and you're looking for a restaurant, and you see a restaurant, and they've got great reviews, and they've got, you know, four stars and all these other things, but then you look at their photos, and you're just like, I'm not sure, I don't know, you know, and you're perceiving that maybe the, the quality of the food is not that great and everything, but I would hazard to say that maybe it's just the quality of the photo, and that there's always a better option as far as how you interact with um, things and, and the way in which you perceive things and how you base your opinion on things based upon what you see. And so um, this might be a wonky uh, adjective, but it kind of relates to how we sort of view the world and also sort of just we use our eyes, right? The way in which we perceive things, we make judgment calls on whether you like something or not. And that really also relates to um, to science and, and how we are, you know, in, in which we communicate our science and knowing that how we communicate our science isn't just about words. It has an equal importance to sort of the visual component and what we do with the words plus the visuals. And in the end, if we can strike that balance, um, we're just going to make some really great sparkly science that people are just going to be more engaged with and they're just going to have, um, it's just going to, um, I don't know, you're, you're going to feel better about the science and they're going to also receive the science better um, as well. So how do you do that? Um, I, I'm going to talk about a, a few things today. First, we're going to talk about how do you connect with your research um, and, and making sure that you understand, uh, you know, that interplay there. We'll talk about very basic ideas around it, um, tools that we'll touch on, as well as, as we just mentioned, collaboration with designers, um, because I know you all aren't designers. But um, there's opportunities there and sort of knowing how to work with those individuals is something that um, I really find helpful in my day to day interaction with researchers. And if I can be a purveyor of that with you all, that, that's all the better. Um, so interrupt me at any point here um, as we go through this. Um, and uh, yeah, we can just jump right in to sort of how to connect with your research. Uh, I, I'm sure you've all heard this phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and for me, when I think about scientific figures and illustrations, I would hazard to say that even though a picture is worth a thousand words, we don't necessarily have to cram a thousand words into a picture. Because um, there's, I mean, there's science is, science is complex, right? There's, there's many components to science and your research and what you can, and, and the ability to create a figure to open up PowerPoint or any design tool and have a blank canvas and just fill it with whatever you want. There's a lot of power in that for sure. There's, you know, and what you can do with that. But also as was once told to a friendly neighborhood spider person, like with that power comes responsibility. We have to have a responsibility to the person who's gonna be viewing these scientific figures to, for them to be able to understand what it is you're clearly wanting to convey um, and knowing that um, and knowing your audience, right? You're not creating this figure for you. I mean, you are, but but in the end, you're, you're, you know the science, you, you don't need a figure for that. <clears throat> and so I think um, as, if you can really sort of hone in 
on what sort of like what's the purpose of a, a, t a figure you know why 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 are you choosing to have to to build a figure in the first place um those that, that kind of basic question um i've never written a scientific paper i don't know what that process looks like for you to sort of say hey i need something to bolster this point um but i think it's you know good to sort of center yourself on that um you know understanding what the core message is um behind a figure uh the other thing is um is is kind of distilling your information and I, I i mentioned sort of like the top three like like keeping it simple like what are the top three things you would want someone to look at your figure and be able to see and understand in you know 10 to 15 seconds right um because they're not going to sit here and just look at it forever um and so to try to keep it simple try to keep it focused you know whether or not something below if maybe you have four or five things that you have in this that you're thinking about for this figure does it belong in this figure can you be a can it be a second figure and sort of understanding context around um how you build your paper whether or not there could be multiple figures you can break things out um also that your figure won't exist on its own it's going to be actually it's going to be um with a caption too and so how much of that information needs to be in the figure versus how much actually can just be sort of spelled out in the caption um it's 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 also knowing your audience and and looking at assumptions and trying to make sure that there's no assumptions on whether they understand something or not um and so yeah um some sort of simple things and then what's unique about your about your research what's what's the unique thing that you're trying to convey in a figure um you know with that it's sort of if you can ground that uniqueness ground grounded in something that people understand or maybe something that you know about your research that they don't um I mean, sergio knows this but a lot sometimes i'll ask for photos if it's a experimental setup um, of something i'll ask for photos of what the device looks like or what the machine looks like or that kind of thing and so really sort of grounding it in something making it specific to your research um because you know they're I don't know, there could be many ways to illustrate some, you know, there's always uh, many ways to illustrate something, but what is the most, you know, what can you do to make it so it's yours and just yours alone? Um, and the other thing is just to keep it focused as well. Um, if you're able to hone in on what that specific special thing is, then let that drive the focus of your figure, make it the most prominent thing in your figure, make it the most colorful thing in your figure. Um, uh, here's here's an example of a figure that I created a number of years ago at Slack. Um, it started out with what you see on the right, which was um, provided to me by the researchers. And from interacting with them and talking with them and looking at this, it's it's sort of you know where where was the focus? What's the what was the thing that made this um, that was supposed to really sell this figure? And at the time, it was it was that there was a sample delivery system sort of happening kind of in the middle. And then also this new way of detecting or this new detector they had. And so with that, I was able to sort of, you know, make those things the most prominent. I was able to grab a CAD asset from um, an engineer and, and work with that as well. And so, you know, bringing that sort of grounding it in the reality, making it look like the thing. It could have just been, as they had over here, it could have just been this image, right? Which is the actual data that they collected. But sort of, you know, being able to ground it in what the actual detector looks like, um, you know, um, I don't think they expected that. I don't think there was any like, you know, we we think that this is a good idea. I think it's just sort of, um, you know, with my skill set or what you feel could be something that could be helpful and and unique and and everything um, is just gonna, I don't know, make your figure that much more special. Um, Sergio probably knows this figure here, but this is where I was talking about sort of. There was a lot of components here and 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 i was just like what does this look like you know i think i was visiting once and he brought me into the lab so i could see these things and we were i, I took some photos or he sent me some photos of what the actual setup looked like and 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 maybe it's you know what we end up with is not as complex as what the actual device is um but i think if you can sort of if start from the core and start from that and say okay this is the thing this is the real thing how can then I you know, base it upon that? Because if you start really heady with concepts, sometimes it's really difficult to really visualize it. Um, so I like I like to ground 
um, you know, ground the illustration in something that seems real. Um, and then others can maybe they understand what that device is, or they have something similar. And so they understand that that's, that's a common language that you can sort of build from. Um, any questions on, on that section, connecting with your research? And Sergio, you've got, you, you know, I've worked a number of times on these things, so. Yeah, I wanted to probe you with, I mean, somewhat of a leading question. What do you do when it's a concept? Like, do you, like, what is the best thing to doodle it up, you know, to, to put in a napkin? Yeah, no, it? absolutely. No, the best thing that, I mean, the, the, for me as a, as a designer, receiving that from someone is, is that, you know, it's, it's all in somebody's head, really. You know, I mean, you have, you know, we all have the ability to imagine things and, to, and, and everything. But when it comes down to actually like getting that onto a piece of paper, it's sometimes a difficult process, right? And so that's where like the simplest things can, can help drive that conversation, it can help bring someone on board. If it's just on a napkin, if it's just a sketch, if it's just boxes and lines connecting things. Um, I'll show a few more examples of that um, in the next section, um, but it's just, it's, it's really just sort of getting those things outside of your head so that others can help, um, can look at it, they can, they can collaborate too. Um, and, um, you know, that's, it's sometimes the most difficult thing because it's really conceptual and no one's ever conceived of it before. A lot of, you know, a lot of science is just groundbreaking, right? And it's new, it's never been done before. And that's why I think, um, if you can just ground it in something um, and, in, and start from somewhere, it's, it's an iterative, iterative process, just like science. So. All right, cool. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to the basics. And we're gonna go really basic here. Um, and first, we're gonna start off with, with size um, because size matters when it comes to technical figures. Um, and I'm talking about designing for like page size because um, I mean, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper is pretty standard journal page size. And you only have a certain uh, a canvas to be able to work from. And we, I, I design on two 30 inch monitors, right? You know, we have, you know, um, the ability to zoom in on things digitally and whatnot. But I think what's really helpful to sort of to think about is, is that your canvas actually really is only that small three inches or six inches wide. And if you if you understand that, um, then you realize that you, you know, the responsibility to only put as much information in there as needs to go in there. When I'm designing, I keep a ruler at my desk. And occasionally if I feel like I'm too much in the weeds, I'll zoom out and I'll make sure that I've got the size down and I'll look at it and I'll squint at it and I'll go, okay, you know, is there's too much text here? Is that not big enough? Can can is it legible? Um, what's the balance look like? Is, and so understanding that, again, like on our monitors, we can create something huge and everything, but once it's shrunk down, it's, it can be really um, limiting as far as how people are able to receive the information. Um, uh, we can also just talk about fonts, basics here. Make sure that you're not cramming too many fonts or, or, or labels inside of your figure too. Understanding that, you know, is there an easier, shorter way, more succinct way to say something? Um, and then try to use consistent fonts as well. Um, and I mean, just one font for your whole figure. And if you're, you know, doing a paper with multiple figures that you use the same consistent font throughout that. Um, I, I personally prefer Helvetica and Arial. Um, a lot of times uh, that's because journals, if they take your figures, they'll want, they'll, they'll be reformatting them anyway. And so you're just being a better citizen by providing those those fonts um, already, um, and then also trying to be consistent about the, your, your size use. Um, again, if if this thing is only going to be three inches on a on a on a piece of paper, we need to understand that you know a certain font size is not going to be legible. Like you just won't be able to see it. So at minimum eight point, um, I usually go with the ten point font, and um, and this is a good example that I borrowed from from online and sort of looking at how you would then on the left, there's this is a figure with a, a number of different components, um, the number of different font sizes, uh, a number of different fonts, and how you would sort of try to reformat to provide some consistency across them um, as far as balance and weight too. Um, but you'll see, like as you can notice, all the fonts are exactly the same size here. Um, and so it's just, it's cleaner, 
Um, and and again, it's making sure that, and I know sometimes straight out of some programs, you'll get like teeny tiny fonts, but I think if you can do your due diligence to edit and try to like reformat what you get out of some scientific tools, it's gonna make for a better figure. Yes, Sergio. And I, I'm ashamed that I have to say this, but another point from the example that you brought up, it's also the alignment and horizontal sort of grids, mm -hmm. vertical grids, right? That, that, you know, sort of access should be aligned, right? And that you can see clearly the difference between those two here too. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it is, it's, it's about understanding the space and that in every tool you use, there's gonna be an align horizontally, align vertically, distribute. And so what understanding what those mean and how to grid out your, your figure so it, um, seems intentional and, and things seem well balanced um, as you see here. It, it's just gonna, it's, it, it makes the information that much clearer and easier to look at. So yeah, very good point. Um, and we can talk about color briefly as well. Um, well, yeah, I'd like to ask a question and there's only a few of you. Um, and this is a question I, I like to ask of scientists because I think it sort of helps them understand as a designer, where I'm coming from, I mean, what color do you think an electron is? Does anyone have like an answer? I, I know what color they are. Anybody, any guesses? Um, I like to think that they're white, but I don't know for sure. I mean, I mean, from what I know, the answer is nobody knows for sure what color an electron is. I mean, Sergio, right? They're obviously blue. <laughs> They're obviously blue. <laughs> but, see, but so what you get from this question, which I really love, is that everyone has an answer, right? And and, and it's all rooted in some, you know, some notion that they perceive, right? If they, whether they saw it somewhere first and that, that triggered some association. But understanding that, that we have certain biases as far as color and are those biases, are they true? Is it, concre is it concrete? And so and in science, there sometimes are colors, right? Um, atoms and molecules, um, you know, some people swear by, you know, a black carbon or a blue, you know, I'm going to get them wrong, blue, some, you know, hydrogen or, you know, or a white oxygen, right? I mean, there's, there's some very defined colors, but if you understand that, though, that that's not a limitation, what you can do is then if, if you have to go with a very specific color, that there might be harmony around that color, right? Can you use that color as you know, if it's strongly present in your figure, can you use that color to, to and balance it out with another color, right? And so I think, I think it's always good to sort of, um, you know, check it if you have specific colors you need to include, or if you don't, then that's great. And you have some latitude around, you know, creating a palette that is harmonious and that isn't like the rainbow, but that is appealing and, 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 and also can be used for focus, right? Um, if there's a really colorful element to your figure, you know, can you diminish everything else by going black and white, right? Can you create focus on the actual thing um, with color? And um, this is a, a figure that I created with some researchers. And, you know, uh, there's a number of ways in which we use color here. And, uh, but the, I mean, the, the, two, the two things here is that there, there's two pulses. One pulse is blue and one pulse is red. And, but we're able to sort of draw your eye with color to understand that where does that blue pulse come from? Well, it comes from this sort of blue, these blue magnets down here. Where does the red pulse come from? Well, it comes from the red magnets. Where, what's the path of the red pulse versus the blue pulse? Well, both pulses have a red, you know, there's a blue and a red pulse path. And then even down here, just, talking about sort of the interaction with the sample, you know, what does the spot look like for the red and the blue pulse, right? And so creating sort of a visual language or a color language within your figure helps people relate things. It seems like there's a lot going on in this figure, right? You got these top things, you got this, this down here, this down here. But if you look at it, it all sort of makes sense because we're using color to sort of tie all the elements together. Um, and then just some basic, um, thoughts around process. Um, I, I, I look for inspiration in anything, whether it's Star Trek or whatever, but you know, but, but 
there are other people out there creating figures, right? You're reading journals, you're seeing what other people are doing, find inspiration um, and be curious about what other folks are doing. Im imitation is, is the sincerest form of flattery, right? And so you're not stealing, what you're doing is sort of adapting. And and um, and I've, I've found that quite often in, in the work I've done at Slack is that I'll look and see, well, somebody kind of made a figure like mine, that's pretty cool, right? You know, um, but they also, they made it their own too, right? And so an understanding that, um, that you can um, you can find a space there to um, to to, to um, play around with, look at ideas. Um, as we mentioned before, start simple and just sketch something out. That's that's it's always a good place to start. Um, and then, as I mentioned, also just don't trust the defaults. If you're going to be creating, um, you know, graphs or or uh, using other tools um, to you know, create elements and, and whether it be charts or anything like that, try not to trust the defaults. Um, they're, they're just gonna give you out of the box kind of things. Um, and that's where you're gonna get small fonts, big fonts and everything like that. And if you were able to, you know, tweak those to the benefit of, of, of the figure, it's just gonna make it um, uh, that much better. And then understand that it's, like I said before, it's an iterative process, just like science. You're gonna start someplace and you're gonna put pen to paper or, you know, pixel to page and from there you're going to have to iterate and it's going to you know it might be a long process it might be a short process but um you know work with others to to um get feedback improve upon your figure and then also just have fun um when i first started at slack there was a part of a component of my job was print production where we actually had like large-scale plotters we did had a heat press and all these other things and i I found that, and I called used to call it my arts and crafts time because it got me away from my computer and it, and and it got me to do something else. And you all aren't designing figures full time, right? That's not your job. Yet you can find space within what you do to sort of you know in you know enable that creative side um, and 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 maybe do something that you just aren't doing all the time and try to find some fun and some some, some space there um, to really kind of enjoy this aspect of it. Um, here are some examples of um, of where a figure started. You know, whether it was a, a rough sketch. This uh, this is what was provided to me by some researchers, and then um, I use um, a number of different three D tools and and uh, and Adobe Illustrator to sort of craft my figures. But you know, the top one's not too bad, right? I mean, it it, it works. But again, you know, they came to me. What can I bring as a designer to this? Um, and 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 it wasn't A to B here. There was an iterative process as far as like you know um, how we how we work through this. Um, Sergio probably uh, remembers this as well. This was this was a sketch. This was a sketch on a whiteboard that started the figure process, right? And again, we have to start somewhere. And then from there, I was able to put sort of digital pen to paper, digital paper, and then we sort of just iterated. Um, and again, there's, you know, what 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 happens behind the scenes um, through those iterations and everything. Um, it, it's it's just going to be um, part of the process. So, um, yeah. Any questions on on that? Any of the basics? There are a lot of other basics you can have out there, like we talked about composition and all these other things. But um, I, I, I think for me, it's just those are the most important things that sort of rise to the surface. All right, so let's briefly go over tools um, and talk about applications. There are a number of design tools out there that um, you're probably familiar with, um, maybe you don't have experience with, yet um, you can get experience with those. Um, I use Adobe Illustrator and the Adobe suite of products. Um, there are free um, and, and open source applications like In Inkscape and GIMP. Um, that's sort of like a, a Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop. Um, they, they really um, match up with those as um, well. So those are some good design tools that are strictly design tools. Again, if you can use what you have as scientific tools as a starting place and then take those components into a design tool, right? Then you're already, um, you know, a part of the way there. Um, the other thing is there's a number of color tools out there too that can help you figure out color. Um, Adobe Color is a website um, where you can look at different color palettes. Um, 
And you can explore color that way. Canva, which I think I know of another number of people who use it for design kind of things. They've got a palette generator. Um, this is what Adobe Color looks like. They even have sort of a tool where you can sort of drag around a color. You can get analogous, you know, complementary colors. And then you can get sort of the codes and everything that you need, as well as they have, um, you know, just a bunch, a palette of harmonious um, color palettes that you can, you know, look to choose from as well. Um, and then uh, just tools as far as, you know, learning to do this. Um, there are plenty of tutorials on YouTube on, on how to do things, whether, you know, you're in PowerPoint, you want to put a glow around a, a laser beam or something like that, right? You know, and I mean, there's there's got to be tutorials on that, right? Um, there's also opportunities for like classes that you can take. I know at Stanford, they have a number of sort of intro to Adobe Illustrator classes, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about, you know, a whole, you know, semesters long course, but just even one course to sort of get your feet wet and to get yourself into, into uh, learning about that is um, something I would recommend. So <laughs> no PowerPoint figures. Well, uh, yes, um, that's, that's very true. I mean, but you work with what you have, um, unfortunately, right? So, um, but also like Google is your friend too, right? I mean, I, I, you're looking for, uh, I need help on creating this in this, right? Just Google it. I mean, again, we're not the only ones doing this out there, um, but I think what I would say is just, you know, you're bringing something sp specific to it, but if you can be informed with some tools and some learning, that's just gonna make the process that much easier for you. Um, but having said that, you know, I understand you're like, oh yeah, this is great, Greg. I feel jazzed. Like you gave me all these like great ideas and everything, but also like, well, I'm not a designer like you, right? Like I, I'm not, I can't even draw like a, fig, a stick figure, right? Like I, I get it, I totally get it. And so that's why I'd like to talk about collaboration with designers like myself, because um, um, I, I don't, I mean, people, people exist out there, design help exists, whether they're staff designers, people who work in your actual like, you know, um, uh, place of work. There's also freelance designers um, and those individuals, um, you know, they work specifically with scientists and on, on scientific figures and everything. Um, and also as well as partnering with your colleagues, you know, some that may have more of a design background than you, or again, partnering with an engineer who has access to CAD related, you know, uh, uh, data and that you can leverage that as well as things. So you're not alone for sure. Um, and then understanding what that partnership looks like, you know, making sure that you're being a good citizen, a good, good, good uh, collaborator with bringing your ideas and sketches um, to, to Sergio's point earlier, you know, where can you start with working with someone? And then um, I am a, a huge purveyor of a single point of contact when working with the designer, because um, again, it's so, science is collaborative and you, you're there's a number of individuals working on the research, but it's always best to have one consistent single voice, a point of contact who's funneling all the, the feedback and and changes into that into the, the designer. And um, it just makes the process much smoother. I never want to have to like choose between feedback from a number of individuals. That's not my job. I just want to be able to sort of get the information I need to, to move the iteration forward. Um, yeah, so providing clear and concise feedback. And then, I mean, and in the end, uh, you know, whether you're creating it or, or whether a designer is creating it, you know, the idea is that you're creating something that's just sort of unique and has never been done before. And that you can, in the end, sort of like feel excited about and proud of, and that those people who are viewing what you're doing and, and, and looking at your science also, you know, get a sense that it's really, uh, you know, some effort went into it, that, you know, it's, it's visually appealing. And I just, you know, that's that's my job, and I, I I get pride in that as well. When I know that I've been a, a, a active participant in helping visualize the science, and so um, I hope that you know all this sort of helps you in that regard as well. So, thanks. Thank you, Greg. That was a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate it. I think um, you know, Greg is a. Uh, that's a wealth of information and education for a graphic design. He just showed a small portfolio of what he actually does in the lab. So, you know, we have some of his time now. And so I wanted to 
invite all of you to ask any questions or tips or you know advice that you may want at whatever level you're at when it comes into uh, you know making your own graphic figures again it can be for papers but it could also be for powerpoint presentations at conferences or posters or you know any sort of uh, display so yeah any question for Greg? Yeah, I, had a qu I had a question um so how many how many people ask you for help with their figures at any given time? Um, well, I, I like to I I like to consider myself like the best kept secret at Slack because I don't we don't charge for the work that I do, and so um, because I don't charge, there's some some I, I I can I can sort of make a space for myself. I can take a job if I don't want, or you know that kind of thing. I I, I never say no to anyone, um, but at, on an average. I mean, it depends. Science is this weird fluid thing and, and writing papers, and it's the mad rush at the end of the year to get your papers done, your research out. And there's just this weird lull in the middle of the year where their hands, you know, their heads down in, in the actual experiment. And so, um, you know, I mean, it, it just, it's an ebb and flow. It really is um, just like, just like science, you know? Yeah. Okay. And then also uh, what, what program do you use? Mainly? Um, yeah, I, I for my 3D, um, I use Lightwave uh, 3D, and it's it's an application I learned in school and that they've updated and I, I used to this day. Um, it's kind of an artistic 3D tool. It's not necessarily a CAD uh, tool. It's kind of like Maya um, or 3D Studio Max. Um, it's 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 sort of um, an artistic tool, but also I use I then take those and I bring them into Power uh, sorry Power Photoshop and Illustrator, and I and I and I create um, things from that. I don't use one tool necessarily. I sort of just aggregate a bunch of things and and whatever, um, I guess whatever gets the job done is kind of the way in which I use, I do feel about it, so. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. Hi, Greg. Thanks for the rich content and You're presentation. Uh, and I have a question, maybe it's very naive, but uh, um, how do you think about the difference between the TOC figure and the cover figure? Um, I mean that that's a it, it's a good uh, it's a good question because and this is I, when I was talking to Sergio about like what we're going to discuss in this specific um, space was you know it's about an, it's about your audience it really is and understanding that different visuals. Um, are used for different purposes. Um, and so like a cover illustration is, I mean, it, it's, it's to sell journals, it's to get people to read a journal, right? I mean, that, that's why a, a, a journal really asks for people to, you know, they solicit those covers and everything. And that's, and, you know, it's also like the, the flashiest thing. It's not going to be the most accurate um, which is kind of where I like to play that sort of dance for you, you know, how accurate can it be, but also just be really awesome looking and really fun and exciting. Um, and so if that's the purpose, then that if, if, you know, it's a technical figure or a table contents figure, that kind of thing, it's for a total different reason, right? It's to sort of set up what your research is talking about. It's to sort of capture, you know, um, you know, the high level things. Um, it needs to be pretty clean and concise. Um, and so I, I think it, it is sort of knowing where, you know, it, it's not going to be the same, right? The process won't be the same. It's also really good just to sort of set expectations around like, you know, how accurate things need to be in this one instance versus this instance. Um, I think sometimes there could be a hangups on like, oh, it needs to be exactly like that electron needs to be blue. And it's just like, well, does it have to be right? You know, can we play around with it a little bit? Um, and so, but if you, if you go in with a mindset of understanding what the specific reason you're, that it, that visual will exist for, then I think you're sort of able to start, um, and have, you know, and, and go from there and not be hung up on the details too much or understand that the details are really important. Thank you, Sergio. Very, uh, thank you. Great. And Sergio, very insightful. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. I just wanted to add something quickly to how's question. I think it's also important to understand at what process in the tutorial process a cover uh, figure comes, and it always comes later, right? So usually, 
I mean, usually you would not bother making a, a you know, a, a copper figure unless you really have, you know, nature or science level results, right, with that type of thing. So first you make your figures for the paper, you get it accepted in a really great journal. And as it, it will become published, you know, when you get an internal sort of acceptance, but it hasn't come out to the public yet, that's a time window where you can actually take probably... Yeah, a, a version of some figure that is in the paper and make it, you know, Greg would make it, you know, really attractive and flashy and remove all the, uh, you know, technicalities. Yeah. So it comes always, it it's, tends to be an afterthought. Yeah, so you don't need to design it early on. Yeah, but I mean, but to that point, and, and I've been in the process, I've been in the whole process, right, where I, I help create a figure, just, I don't know the context of it, right, whether it's a setup figure, and then I don't hear two years later or something, right? And they go, oh, we'd like cover art. Remember that figure you did way back in the day? I'm like, yes, maybe, no, I don't know, right? You know, but it's but it's kind of, I, I enjoy sort of being able to sort of have multiple touch points without, you know, throughout that to help visually explain the science, whether it be technically and then artistically as well. Um, but yeah, try not to make it too much of an afterthought because that really stresses me out. Um, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> That was more for you, Sergio, than anybody else. Yeah, I got that. I got that. <laughs> uh, so uh, when we want to uh, submit the uh, cover cover figure, uh, is this uh, during the proofreading process or after the proofreading? Yeah, it's it's normally when you're when it's been accepted when it's been accepted to the journal. That's um, so you know you have an acceptance. And you know, and that's usually not contingent upon much. Then, right? I mean, you still have to go through the oh, process of back and forth I with the see. journal. But if you've been accepted, you're you're in, right? Yeah, different yeah. Journals, so different so this scale. this time is very short. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it depends on the journal. Some journals have a really short time scale. Some others may have like four to six weeks. So, but you have a pretty good sense of. You know, I would say before proofreading, if you're proofreading your manuscript, it means it's making it, right? So, um, yeah. And, you know, even if it doesn't make it, to the, then there is a selection process for the cover figure. So even if it doesn't make it, you know, making the figure doesn't mean it'll make it to become a cover. Um, and so, I mean, that speaks to uh, Greg's track record in getting really awesome cover figures, right? That's that's really an accomplishment. In 17 years, yes. So <laughs> not all of them, but but I, but also like to say is that just because you create it doesn't mean it has to, like for that doesn't mean it can't be exist for other things, right? You know, that you'll be able to use that to talk about your research in presentations or that kind of Websites, thing. Websites. So, yeah, so media. to get the more bang out of your effort, um, you know, in creating that, that cover, even if it's not chosen. So it can be used for anything else. And even if it is chosen, they, the journal doesn't own your your illustration. All right, they're going to give you a piece of paper that says, "Yeah, here, sign over the, the the everything to us for this illustration." But there's actually another form that you should fill out where it's just they just get the rights to to use the the illustration, um, and then you can use it for whatever else you want to. So. If there are no other questions, I wanted to, at least to give some room to other questions. I wanted, Greg, if you could explain briefly the importance of choosing whatever the platform to, to making vector file figures, uh, you know, uh, whether that's for collaborative purposes or just for own, you know, editing purposes, as opposed to, you know, making something with pixelated figures you know it's a bit of the basics but i think sometimes it's it's something that people miss yeah yeah no absolutely that's a i mean it's, it's a it's a it's an it's another basic you're right it's another basic that i i was like do i go into those details but it's important because i mean you've all seen the you know very pixelated imagery right where people just blow up you know whatever small file and, and make it big or that kind of thing and so with using vector artwork um, or vector, you know, creating with vector graphics, it's sort of, it's, it's seamless. There's, there's no pixels. It's all just sort of lines and, and everything. Um, and so uh, as much as you're able to, when creating your scientific figures, have a, the vector component, um, that's going to make it so if you do have to resize and everything, you're not worried about, you know, blowing up pixels. Um, that's kind of why I also mentioned, even if you aren't going to use vector, try to design for 
the, 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 you know, that three inches or that six inch width. So then you're not having to worry about, oh crap, I made it too small and now I got to blow it up, right? And so if you can start with the size and understand that, that's just going to help you, even if you aren't able to do it in vector. But, but yeah, journals for sure. If journals want access to your figures um, to make them more consistent with their, the way in which they display their figures, whether it's fonts, whether it's line widths, all that kind of thing, they're going to want vector files as well. And if you can provide those, that's, that's going to, um, again, you're just you're going to be um, faster in the process um, of them working with you too. So. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, oh, yeah, please. Uh, I want to ask, uh, how do I know that I spend too much time designing the graph? Because, uh, yeah, I've been writing a paper before, and I just realized that I spent making graph for two or three weeks, and I just realized, oh, I, I haven't written anything on paper. <laughs> I, I mean, uh... I mean, you could spend as much time as you as you as you want. I think mm -hmm. what's what's good is is even if you're designing for yourself, it's always good to have somebody who's who's taking a look, who's providing you mm -hmm. feedback, right? And so, and that helps you get out of your own head because I totally understand as an artist and someone who's slightly OCD about just making things perfect and everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's al it's always good to have just an extra set of eyes on it, right? And whether that mm -hmm. be a family member, whether that be an actual, you know, someone who really knows what they're talking about. Um, I think that's, that's going to help the process because you, I mean, they say art, you know, there's, you're never done with art, right? Oh, art is this thing that can just last forever, right? And it's like, no, no, I mean, at a certain point, you have to move on to the next thing, right? It has to be done. You have to say, I am done with this thing. But if you're not ready to make that decision, then, you know, allow someone else into that space to be able to sort of be that person for you or be, you know, just, you know, to um, help you with that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I totally get it. Um, but I think it, yeah, if you can, if you can leverage the feedback of others, the feedback of others and be open to, you know, critique and getting feedback, mm -hmm. that's also really hard to do sometimes is to sort of, you know, open yourself up. You spend a lot of time on something and then you're like, oh, what do you think of this? And people are like, eh, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's also part of it too, but it's a learning lesson. You sort of learn how to take feedback, how to how to give feedback, how to you know, and um, it's just going to make you. I don't. Know, again, everything we do is sort of is collaborative, and I think is in, in, in any aspect of our lives, as much as we're able to sort of be open and vulnerable about what we create, understand that it's, it's it can be precious to us, but in the end, it's it's just it's it's okay to sort of like you know uh, share that with others. I think you know in the end, you're going to be sharing with a scientific community, right? And so it, as much as you can get outside of your own head during that process, it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to help you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, Greg. I have another mm -hmm. question. Um, when we have some high resolution figures, uh, like the, uh, I usually use PDF to convert figure, but sometimes the size is too big and the some uh, transactions uh, require only maximum five uh, MB or even smaller. So if if we have a high resolution figure, how how can we uh, reduce the memory of the figures? But yeah. uh, we still want the high resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. No, and and you're right. Just because it's you want it high res doesn't mean it has to be like ultra, ultra, ultra high res, right? There's optimization that you can do to images. Um, and that, and it depends on the application. If it's PDF, you know, it's, it's a setting. It's a way in which to export or save out of Adobe Acrobat, right? And I would just say, Google it, you know? I really would and just say, you know, what, what's the best way to optimize saving out of this application or saving this with the idea that you want a smaller file size. And, and there's ways in which to do it. Um, there's there's ways in which to really do it with like a big hammer or to try to do it a little more nuanced with, you know, um, and so you're not just really just compressing things. Um, it's, 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 it can be an art form as well, but um, I would look and see because other, there's, there's plenty of resources out there on, on figuring that out, so. Thank you. Welcome. 
uh, hi Greg. Um, may I ask a question about the program used to plot three D three D figures for journal journal papers? Mm -hmm. I I really like this kind of figures. Can may I share my screen? Certainly. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you see this? I really li like this kind of figure to show the light paths and the uh, um, optical elements. But I I I still uh, confusing. Which kind of program should I start to to learn to plot this this kind of figures? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I mean, this uh, this looks like it was uh, probably made with a CAD software, um, just by the the really technical nature of how things are being portrayed. You know, you've got some nuts and bolts and screws in there, right? As an artist, I wouldn't put that stuff in there. In fact, I've taken a lot of CAD models and just stripped away all the the screws and the bolts because they're just extraneous information that you don't need but that's what looks like it's here and so they probably you know had access to the cad data or they worked with an engineer to 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 figure out you know can you show me the setup can you show me the view you know and, and you know you sort of work with them to say this is kind of what i'm looking for they're able to render out a, a still graphic and then i would hazard to say that like these the lines you see on there the the, the laser light, the the red glow, you know, the red glowy beam, that was probably added later. Um, that's something uh -huh. you can add in another program on top of it. Kind of like I was telling you, I use a number of different programs to make something, um, uh -huh. to make one thing. And so, you know, understanding that not one program might give you everything. Um, you know, how can you achieve this by combining a, a couple different programs together? Oh, so maybe I can use SolidWorks to to draw the yes. plow the to plow the, the the optical elements, and then later I I can use Photoshop to add the light the laser on it. Exactly, absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah, because okay, that's just you. a it's it's okay. just an engineering program, right? They're not gonna it's not a physics based <laughs> program, right? Okay. Um. So yeah. So no, it's it's that yeah, SolidWorks. Yeah, absolutely. Getting that CAD data, and if you you know how to use SolidWorks, then getting that CAD data from the engineer, being able to create your own. You know images from that and then add the the science on top of it that's that's a great that's i mean if you're capable of doing that that's awesome okay thank you Gary. Yes, thank sir. you so much i see if if i may chime into that sometimes there is an intermediate step when you have a solidworks figure uh you know these cad design tools do have their own internal rendering uh tools but they're not as elaborate as some other rendering tools so sometimes you can use the the, the step file so to speak to and have a program to render it, you know, to give it a specific diffuse scattering or shadowing effect or more real looking effect or, or whatever you're looking for. So there's also a, a whole family of rendering softwares for cat figures uh, if you don't want to use whatever, um, you know, SolidWorks has. For sure. Yeah. Again, those the defaults that you have with applications, right? You know, it doesn't, you don't have to use the default. There might be settings even within uh, SolidWorks that are, that are, you know, where you can finesse those things. But yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, going off that, um, would you be able, uh, I have another figure I'm kind of interested in the style of, and I was wondering if you might know what kind of program it is, if I can share my screen. For sure. Yeah, I'd have, have to take a look. This, this one? Something uh, like this. That's my figure. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> actually, I, I created that figure. So awesome. Um, with, with 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 Sergio's uh, assistant in collaboration as well. Maybe that was, or maybe that was a, you know, I don't know, Randy or somebody. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you can see that there's a number of different components here, right? And you got you have some very two two dimensional sort of side pieces, right? You know, one, two, yeah. three, four, five. Those I created in just Illustrator um, at the vector program. So just those are just vector. Um, and again, it was understanding that we didn't need them to look crazy flashy. We needed them to actually represent the science, the very basics of the science. Um, and and that's sort of knowing when to use, a, you know, 3D versus not 3D, making sure that the technique you use to create is not taking away from the actual science. Um, and then in the in the middle here, I created that in my 3D program, but those things can be very simply made in Illustrator and you can actually, there's some 3D functionality in Illustrator to be able to extrude shapes and everything. <clears throat> 
so you could you could use that as well um and so then this is with lightwave you said i, I used lightwave for that specifically but okay. it's just because it's my 3d program of choice but again you can create you know i mean if you look at at, at number three and number four right you know they show this this black box right i mean that it's just a black box um and and you can just extrude that shape or you can just draw you know it with um just simple line art too right mm -hmm. um so, so you can use like solid works for something like this as well you could for sure or you can just or you can use um yeah i mean you know yeah it's, uh, yeah i think yes get google sketchup absolutely yeah um and, and again it's it's sort of you know that was the tool i use um you know do, does it have to be in three dimensions right can it could it be just a two-dimensional top-down view right and sort yeah. of understanding that you know you don't have to make it flashy as long as it just looks you know engaging and people understand what's going on here and and there's a nice balance to the figure too so okay yeah awesome thanks greg yeah sure welcome <laughs> Well, I appreciate everybody's engagement just for the sake of time. I think, uh, you know, I wanted to thank Greg and I you know, wanted to ask everybody to thank Greg for his time and giving us a, you know, a short tutorial on how to be better at communicating science through illustrations. So thanks a lot, Greg, uh, for making the time. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Thank you all very much for your uh, questions and participation. All right. Take care. All right. Bye.